Hey folks. Thank you for coming in this LA torrential downpour. My name is Ryan Johnson. Let's welcome to the stage Mr. David Fincher. So let's, uh, yeah, let's start with the uh, most basic Q&A question of all time. It's kind of, I know this was something that was kind of gestating in some form for a while, and I know that you, yeah, just to, to, to add comments. I, I think that, I think that. That's not quite right. I mean, we started talking about it. I'm off to a great start. <laughs> no, 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 you can read the internet. So, um, so we, we, we talked about it in 2008, and, and, but we didn't really start um, you know, trying to break it down in terms of what it was going to be till 2019. So it's not like you know, everyone was holding their breath. It was kind of yeah. like it came back into our lives when we were, and called Andy and said, I want you to read this and put us on the stage. Yeah, and I know that you've uh, you've although now I'm believing the internet again. <laughs> this is my this is this is my I'm superpower. Sure Worked your whole world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, it makes this I believe because it makes a lot of sense. You've mentioned *Le Samurai* by Melville yeah. as a big point of reference for this. I see a lot of Hitchcock in it. Um, what would and maybe both of you, David and then Michael, talk about what was it about uh, about the comic first of all that made you think this would be a thing to bring to Andy, and what was that conversation with him, and, uh, oh boy. yeah, uh, come on. Okay, um, yeah, I, I read the comics, and it had this voiceover in it, and it was very nihilistic and cynical, and, and of course, very appealing, and, um, <laughs> and I just, I, I kind of honed in on this idea of, like, how to transfer the notion of extreme subjectivity from from a comic book to the to the screen and that was really it. it was like what are the ways that we're going to we want to make the narrative there's no doubling back there's no twist you're going straight forward but we wanted to make it as subjective as possible so every time we could have the sound come from one side of the theater and not the other with when he has one earbud in his ear or how we come in and out of you know, what he sees the scope when he's listening to his music to what it sounds like when we're three feet away shooting a close up, that was the uh, thing we did. Yeah. <coughs> Over to you. <laughs> no, no, I'll ask you an actual question. Okay. Yeah, that'd be a good thing to, for me to do. Um, uh, so, yeah, Mike, I wanted to ask you actually about, uh, about voiceover and specifically about uh, while you were shooting, because so much of the movie is driven by the singer monologue. Um, how did you handle that during the shooting of these, especially the scenes that are all about your, about all about his process? Um, did you have that monologue in your head? Did you refer to it? Were you thinking in terms of the voiceover, or were you kind of, yeah? How did you deal with that? I, I was trying not to think at all. Um, <laughs> pretty much, actually. You know, um, uh, just sort of. For me, you know, it really just depended what, what was happening in the scene. I didn't really refer to the monologue at all, thinking, okay, this is what I'll be thinking in this particular, you know, um, scene or setup. Um, for me, it was just dependent on what the character was doing, when it was doing it, waiting, it's sort of observing, um, just trying to keep oneself focused, but just a, a basic sort of chain of events that somebody would have in the structure of whatever they do. Mm. So he wants to do this correctly. There's there's a schedule that he'll lay out for himself every time, which is like yoga mm. and uh, various things. So no, I just- And really protein. And his protein. Uh, and what? And his protein. Uh, and protein. And eggs and- <laughs> Yoga protein. And, uh, and the ham. Um, <laughs> lots of ham. Um, um, but it was, yeah, it was, uh, it was more about that, the action. I didn't really- refer to it at all it's a, i mean it's a i love the performance it's such a physical performance and it's so much driven i mean that makes sense it's so driven by um by process and during I, it was funny because i was just i came in just got to watch the the tilda scene and you had that line in there i was desperate for conversation and so yeah. so much of the movie you are um and i know i i, I know uh 
my own experience whenever I shot even limited scenes where it's just me and an, an, an actor doing procedure. There's a real in intimacy that develops there just because your scene actor is kind of the, the director, is kind of the camera. And, um, you talk about your partnership like during the movie, I guess, um, and also specifically rehearsing. Uh, how did you block and rehearse these complicated scenes? That, that's what was very strange about this movie is that A, we made it during COVID. <laughs> B, yeah, you have 10 lines on camera. I mean, we looped the entire movie in like an hour with all of your on, on screen dialogue. So there was no real, um, there's, there's no read through. You know, it's kind of like you show up and we would lay out, here's all this, here's what's being said. And we would hear it in rehearsal and then, and then we would lay out what it is that we had to do. And then we would just squeeze it and go, okay, that's great. That was 48 seconds. Can you do it 41? Can you do it in 38? And it was just like taking, taking everything and like just refining and refining and the balsamic reduction of, of behavior. But um, it was almost, I think it was like day three, you said to me, um, oh, precision modeling. And I was like, <laughs> no, it's not precision modeling. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, Which is cutting and horrible, because um, I still remember it, but uh, I just bring it up as a uh, The, um, <laughs> the gloves. The gloves. Yeah. Oh uh, my God. What's the gloves? The gloves were sticky. <laughs> Those black, they're... They were rubber, because they, they had a... They're, big... they're, they're you fisting them, Do you want to tell them what it is? <laughs> I think, I think... Some I of think you are laughing, yeah. so... It's true, I think we bought them out of their gloves. Yeah. yeah, there are, there are no fisting gloves on the West Coast. Um, they were all shipped in the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we used them all up. But, but because um, because they were that particular type of glove, um, funny enough, they would get stuck. <laughs> On what? <laughs> make, make a note. Yeah. Um, in, in pockets, you know. Uh, yeah. All right, all right. yeah, you can't like you can't do you can't take anything out of your pocket with these gloves on. The... <laughs> like, yeah, they're incredibly incredible. <laughs> Uh, things to know. Yeah, yeah no. I'll never think it. <laughs> uh, so um, I've completely forgotten my next one. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs> uh, oh, and by the way, I should uh, don't uh, don't wait back. I'm gonna I'm gonna badger them for a few more minutes, and then we will throw it out to you guys, and we'll take questions from the audience. I'm sure you got a bunch of them. Um, uh, so where is it? Where did you guys actually travel to during COVID, which um, I'm sure was very easy and pleasant? Where did you, yeah. where did you actually travel to? Yeah, to it was Paris, uh, Dominican Republic, um, New Orleans, New Orleans, Chicago, and Chicago played Buxton, New York, and New Orleans also played for Florida. Mm -hmm. So that was yeah, and then some in Santa Clarita <laughs> for process. And this was and when did you actually shoot this? Was it like at how thick in the depths of um, we were kind of at the tail end. I mean, yeah. people were going back to work, but it was still the Andromeda strain. I mean, we're in like visors and the whole. <laughs> <Don't mind. laughs> it was pretty good. Uh, I want to. I want. I did. I want to talk really quick about the uh, about the sound and about the music. That's the other thing. Yeah. Um, so. You don't like yeah. sound. Because right. <laughs> uh, that's the other thing watching the movie. It's, I mean, first of all, it's um, it's impossible for me to, to pull apart and separate the sound design from the score, the score right. itself. And um, I'm not talking about the Smiths, I'm talking about the actual yeah. movie. Yeah. Um, and uh, I know that Ryan Clay's our mutual friend, you've worked with yeah. many, many movies. Yeah. And when you talk about subjectivity, you, the first only stuff you talked about was sound and green regards to that is so incredible I know it's not the only thing but so incredibly important and so effective in this can you talk about working with him and also with with transdramaticus in terms of the score and how those two sure um, it, it, it's not first of all one of the things that we knew because I've made some movies that have voiceovers before is that the human voice occupies sort of a mid-range I mean it goes up goes down but it's kind of right in the center and so 
in order to not make that normal mistake where you go, it's so great, but can you take all the mid-range out of it? Um, but to the score, I, I we talked Trent and Atticus through it, sort of saying, take the high end, take the subwoofers, and we'll sort of exist in the middle for the voice. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and also for the a lot of the sound effects. So it was really that, it was like the full spectrum was covered, but we were kind of going, you know, there's the first layer of the cake, second layer of the cake, and then the icing, and, and we were kind of, we just parsed it so that everybody had, everybody knew that it would have room. Mm. Um, did you have a question? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Kind of and, um, and I think it was the first batch of stuff that um, TNA sent over that we started like laying it up against picture. And they do do a little bit of a litmus test, you know, they kind of like find the stuff that you're partial to. So there was a real smorgasbord. And I remember calling Atticus and, and saying, we really like this one, and we really like this one, we really, and he was like, oh, the weird stuff. <laughs> so, I felt like we were on the right path. Uh, there's, yeah. And then, and Ren's contribution was, of course, he has to kind of, as you know, wrangle the whole thing, making sure that there's enough space for right. everything that has to happen in 5.1. Yeah, and it's also, it's phenomenal even just hearing it in this theater. I had watched it yeah, at home first and watching it here and just really, really getting your head inside there. Um, Michael, in terms, in terms of the, uh, well, I guess you had to answer it a little bit at the beginning in terms of trying not to think of anything but the process. I was gonna ask you with a character who's this, um, I don't know. Who, 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 who. There is there is kind of a a blank slateness to him in a terrifying way that is kind of really scary. To, it's like looking into a shark's eyes a little bit. What what is your way into it? But you answer it already. Process. Never mind. So no no no. But how did you when you, you read the script? What was your kind of your way into this? Um, I thought I should use this. Um, uh, I, it, a lot of it was just what you said, you know, looking at animals, looking at, at what animals do when they're hunting for something. Mm. Um, you know, you, it's just, you know, it's the idea of just observing, you know, in a way that's so focused that you're just waiting for the right moment. So there's no emotional content in it. It's just dissociation to the emotional element of what you're going to do by sort of killing somebody, you know. Um, and, and that was something that, you know, David was aware of as well. He was like, hmm, don't, you know, keep it, keep that, you know, the sort of blank expression, you know, I tend to frown and sort of, you know, to have a sort of frowning situation, it's like, don't frown. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that, you know, that, that was definitely from the beginning when we started to look and put the character together was this idea of sort of, you know, what you said, like a blankness, so people can start to, you know, fill in the character themselves as well, um, somewhat, and then the idea of that there is this inner monologue, that there is the, the idea of somebody who spends most of the time by themselves, going to be going crazy a little bit, you know, there was that element in there too. Um, but yeah, the idea of just not making it as well cool, or, you know, I, I, at one point I was like, maybe I should jazzed it up a little, um, you know, um, but you know, the idea was just to, to, to take it like, so even when we were dressing the character at the beginning, it was like, let's, you know, the samurai, Alain Delon looks amazing, you know, the hat's amazing, and we just started looking. None of that. This is quirky, this is like, you know, this is, this is it, it, it's, it's a little off. Yeah. And um, you know. And also we were committed to this idea that this guy could walk to an airport and buy a whole new suitcase full of stuff. Idea. You know, it was like, you know, he's walking past Skechers, he's gonna go past J. Crew, uh -huh. he's gonna see Abercrombie and Fitch, he's gonna go to Hammock Schlemmer, he's he's set, he's got his fisting gloves. <laughs> Can't get them at the airport no, though. No. <laughs> but near the airport. <laughs> I read. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's also the elements of uh, when when it is that disciplines a performance as an audience, we're searching for every little thing. And so every little thing is so amplified. For example, like in the scene with uh, with Tilda Restraint, I'd be curious if you guys 
um, have anything to speak to in terms of, in terms of shooting that scene, which is so vastly, it's, it's, it's so different from the rest of the film. It feels like this kind of um, strange like intake of air like near the end of the film, just to sit and have this long conversation. What, um, but I, I found myself watching your, watching your face during the whole thing, and every little thing of a reaction just read uh, like a big, like a big siren. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, I don't really have a question. It was, a, it was an interesting lesson too, because I mean, I, I, I attempted in the last, you know, couple of movies, trying not to get too close. You know, I wanted things to play. I don't want the camera to have to move around too much. It's like the idea of capturing performance as something that's sort of at arm's length. And, all this stuff is like scopes and bold action and cell phones and like it's all so tight. You yeah. know, it became it was an interesting thing. You know, part of the thing I love about digital is you get a thirty-inch monitor that everybody sees the same thing now for the first time in cinema. Like you know, the boom operator is seeing what the makeup artist is seeing, what the director is seeing. Um, but even on a thirty-inch monitor, there were things that I was finding in like early takes that I, when we got into these piercing close-ups just massive close-ups it was like there was a lot of activity going on that i kind of wasn't even aware of the you know when we were shooting it you know oh that was great send that one but then you find a really early take that had kind of an amazing idea in it and that stuff would wind its way in yeah um i mean you guys with one more before we throw it out to to the audience what i, I want to ask you about editing real quick and working with uh working with kurt i know um especially with a film like this i would suppose so much of it was um uh, so tightly designed in terms of how you approach shooting these uh these sequences is well is that is that the case or am i trusting the internet again? no but also the, yeah. how much play happens in the yeah. in the edit you know? um we didn't storyboard anything. I mean, we, we what? <laughs> wow. No, That's um, crazy. because we kind of had to. First of all, I went over there. Uh, I'm gonna digress just a little bit. Um, I went over to Paris thinking there's not a street corner in Paris we can't shoot. We will find these locations and like, and I didn't realize how much the the kind of architectural formula for. Um, Paris is whatever the span of the wall is almost two-thirds of it is wall mm -hmm. and the windows are normally a third and vertical and the the walls are very deep and the rooms are recessed so it's kind of like like stacked letter boxes or shark skills you know it's just like a vertical slot so it's very difficult on a real apartment building to get any kind of view into it unless it was a brand new you know kind of if it, unless it felt like it was a patio that had been put or an extension that was put onto a penthouse. So we ended up having to do all that stuff in CG. We ended up having to do the entire view across the street in CG because we couldn't find an apartment building that we can actually dress and get inside. And that opened up a whole can of worms, you know, because you, so it was a lot of reacting to the, reacting to locations. And then, so we didn't really go in, we, we went in trying to impose our will on what it is that we want, but we were thwarted by reality. <laughs> <laughs> Happens way too often. Let's, uh, let's throw it out to you guys. Let's just, do we have, uh, how's this working? We got some folks with mics out there. Yeah, there's the man with the plan. Uh, let's go down right here in front to start it out. Um, uh, amazing film. Amazing film. I was so taken by that fight scene. Oh my God! Can you please talk about that? Dude, like I was like, what? like, yes, and I was feeling every yeah. punch. Every like, that dude was huge, <laughs> huge. Sala is here. Yeah, so where is he? There he is. Oh. 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 He's, 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 he's never been the same again. <laughs> he's very deceptive because he's literally the kindest human being I've ever met. So, yeah. um, it was amazing. I, mean, I felt him hitting me. Like, I felt, I felt you. It, it was amazing. Please talk about that. So amazing. You know, I, I, I gotta say, I mean, the stunt, you know, team really took care of it. Not true. Not true. 
<laughs> no, he, he did a lot of work. He just didn't do any of the stuff that when I would look over at Sion and um, our producer and my wife, she would be like, you're not doing that. Like, there would be people, you know, we just did it. It's, it's hard to hurt people. And, and the, the fallacy of a stunt performer is that they somehow figure out a way not to get hurt. Not get hurt. <laughs> they just learn to deal with being hurt for like days on end. So um, we tried as much as we could, and and hats off to the endurance. But um, no, it was really just photographing people harming each other <laughs> but relentlessly. You, but you did that as well with the sound, which was super interesting in that fight sequence. It, we we. In the first couple of days of dailies when we were assembling stuff, there's a lot of kind of vocalization that happens between people in a fight, especially one that's this choreographed. And so a lot of the uh, Especially uh, actors like Oosh. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, it's a little like yeah. It's a little like a friend of ours who, who's telling me it, he did a movie where he had to fire a gun repeatedly into the camera in slow motion. And he went to dailies and he saw himself going. <laughs> so it's that thing of like you, you, I mean, you're doing it without even kind of knowing that you're doing it but when we took the first couple of days of shooting and we cut them together I just asked to duck all the vocalization just so it's just the hits and stuff so you don't hear because they're trying to you know, if the highway patrol comes by because the dogs are barking and they have to answer the door, it's a very awkward way to talk about why you're trying to kill somebody in their sleep. So we were like, how do we make it the quietest two people trying to kill each other that we've ever seen? Uh, real quick, what was the uh, choreographing that very elaborate fight sequence? What was that process like? What do you, what do you? Uh... Well, Dave McComer, who he may or may not be here, I'm not sure. But he was the um, stunt coordinator, and it was about, I don't know, I'm going to say six weeks of like conversations on the phone, and then they would do stunt biz, and they would send us, you know, cut sequences. And we could kind of go, yeah, this is beautiful. We'd love to do this. We will have a dolly in the room, so we'll have to get, you know, 300 pounds of solid steel out of the way of people who are trying to hurt each other. Um, so we, you know, we worked on it. We just was back and forth. It was a, a very open and elaborate discussion for weeks on end. <laughs> Re regarding the guns and some of the more mechanical things, how much did you get into to the practicing of all those things? And are there any things you practiced that might surprise us besides the, the gun stuff? Uh, I did a lot of tell yoga. Tell yeah, yeah, yoga. yeah, the yoga. Um, <laughs> yoga, it, but it, uh, no, l literally taking that rifle apart no. all the time. Oh, oh sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I was just a uh, professional uh, show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> should be able to do that. Um, uh, just taking the rifle apart because I wanted to do it without looking at it. So just putting it together, taking it apart, putting it together. I remember uh, we were staying in an apartment and a woman came from downstairs. She was delivering something that had been dropped at reception and I was kind of taking apart her weapon putting it together like a blindfold and she came in <laughs> I, I was like yes just put it on the table um, so a lot of that and then actually handling of weapons was an interesting one because I didn't really do it like a military person I wanted to first of all bring back the 70s stance with a pistol and I, I, I did say to David I was like it's not too abracadabra is it like, I don't think so it's like no, it's not abracadabra um, but I wanted to sort of do that differently I, I didn't want it to seem like these sort of military trained I wanted it to be like this is a guy that's sort of fallen into this you know and and he's, has trained himself um, so yeah it was pretty much and yoga <laughs> and fingertips, push-ups. <laughs> Insanity. Uh, what else we got? Is someone back there? I'm sure there must be. Who's her name? Who's Where? Oh, there we go. Right there. there. I was I was going to ask about the Ferris government because I noticed that some of the distances changed. Uh, you know, in the shooting between where he is in the WeWork and the apartment, but. You know, I didn't notice it till the second viewing of the movie. So it, 
it's, 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 all on, it's all marked up in CAD. I mean, so it should maintain. I mean, there may be that focal lengths, a lot of times you use the same focal length for his POV, uh, but we'd alter the distance. Sometimes you use a track and we'd use the beginning of the track and we'd use the end of it. So it may have been, a, it, it's actually, um, uh, it was fairly well laid out, so it, it shouldn't be. Shouldn't no, be. It, it, you have to watch. But I wanted to ask about thematically in the script. Um, did you change the voiceover uh, much during uh, afterward? Was there a lot of work on it? And could you talk about that? And one of the kind of motifs of the voiceover is the few and the many. And his perspective seems to change on that. And I wondered if it's just he's, it's his final shedding of an illusion about, you know, that she doesn't have many or just he's forced into it. Uh, okay, so the uh, having made movies where people have voiceovers, I I warn Michael up front, I, we're going to do this four times. We're going to do it one time so we have it to cut with. The second time, we're going to start taking it seriously. By the time we get to the third time, we're doing it for real. And then the fourth time, there's pickups for the... And that's pretty much what it ended up being. Um, um, to get... Um, you know, a, a lot of stuff gets rewritten just to like drop the adverbs. You know, you kind of go, you write the first version and, and you think it's pretty terse and then you see it against picture and you go, picture's doing half the job for you. You don't need, you know, you don't need this. Um, but the other thing was to get, and by the time we got to the third iteration of it, we had worked out this whole thing with a massage table and a <laughs> microphone and the monitor was on the ceiling. And so Michael could lay down and look at the, and do the looping that way. We tried doing it face down through through the hole and put, put too much pressure. Um, so a lot of weird stuff went into getting that such as well. um, What was the other part? Oh, the intonation was just a performance, just a performance that we just thought that was an interesting way to go out. The question was about the talking about the few and oh, the many, the the not many. wanting to be one of the many. Right. And at the end, he is. Yeah, right. but it's the you're talking about the intonation. It's not actually mic'd differently. It was all recorded pretty much at the same. No, time. I'm just talking thematically. Yeah, his well, it's to to illustrate his the change from who he is at the beginning, thinking I'm I'm an elite assassin looking down on this little drama, and I have this perch, and then at the end when he realizes that the you know the guy who's who ordered people to come to his house and savage his girlfriend, when he realizes that was a rounding error, he kind of goes, I'm not sure. I don't know if I want to be in that club. Thank you. Oh, here we go. We got some hands going up now. Oh, way in the back there, way up there in the, in the cap. Thanks. Uh, great film, great performance. Um, could you just talk about the uh, the aliases, just because there was the delightful people in this room you know, have gotten all the references? That is Andrew Kevin Walker, who um, um, likes Nick at night, and um, <laughs> and just came up with this gag, and we um, and we just laughed at it, so we thought we got to print up some. IDs and some passports and some credit cards and somewhere in here we're going to get Ruben Kincaid. Uh, who else we got? Can we come back down front, this gentleman right here. I'm assuming you're trying to call a number of bodies in this film, but I can't. But why not the dog? Why not hurt the dog? Yeah, why didn't he, why didn't he do that? If he, why didn't he kill the dog? Mm -hmm. Nothing to be gained. But wouldn't it have been easier just to, uh, look, I wouldn't want you. <laughs> <'Cause> it, <laughs> oh, <laughs> sir. I mean, I, I see what you're saying. So rather than put it to sleep, kill it. But I guess then if the guy calls it, and the dog doesn't, you know, a sleeping dog looks like a sleeping dog, but obviously if it's dead, Depending on the timing, yeah, it you seems know. mean. But some room. Yeah. Not subject. necessarily mean. Huh? I thought it was a deep subject. Yeah, no, I think you know the you know I just didn't think you know unnecessary. I would say, um, 
and nothing to be gained. And we lose a little bit of his process, the idea that he's, you know, when when he goes to the market, we're going, okay, it's more fun. to 40 ounce beer and salmon eggs and ground beef. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a lonely weekend. <laughs> <laughs> never kill the dog. Never, 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 never. never, never. Uh, let's see, we still, we still got a little bit more time. How about on the second row? Oh, that's the fourth row. Yeah. Hi, David. Hey. Um, just, it's, you're, it's so, so taught because, it's so taught because of omissions. And I'm wondering how much between you and the writer, uh, we have to learn about, like, where you feel you dispose of bodies and all that kind of stuff. Did you do a lot of that research, or was it part of the writing? You see a few things about how he does For the bodies, and it's so pared down. Was it in the editing? Was it in the writing? Was no, we, we, we really, like, the bucket the, off the, you know. Yeah, I mean, the idea was to, you know, one of my favorite things in Psycho, okay, is, is when Tony Perkins cleans up. I mean, it's to me, it's the most terrifying thing in the whole, in the whole movie and so you know andy and i've talked about that before and he wanted to he wanted it to be the drudgery of like this is what you have to do and you got plastic sheets and you've got zip ties and you this is what you you go to home depot a lot um <laughs> but um but no the idea was the idea was to make a don siegel movie like let's hit the fucking ground running let's know where we're headed let's get there as fast as we can and there's and there's no doubling back and there's no twists. So people think that the movie's about an assassin, it's really about getting through that door. <laughs> but not know. a lot on the editing floor? Like not a few I think there's probably, I don't think there's any scenes on the, I don't think there's any scenes that we, I mean, we went to, to make it as lean and mean as we could, just not to dogs. <laughs> Michael, how many innards of egg McMuffins did you have to actually consume? That's maybe the most horrifying image. You don't have to answer that question. <laughs> uh, not too many, actually. Um, I didn't, uh, you know, it, it's always handy when you have a bag close by. <laughs> you know, just, uh, Important safety tip. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. First. But, okay. Remember, you did say you were like, to be, be careful of your sodium intake. <laughs> uh, uh, and the beat goes on. What else we got? How about a way back up there in the corner? Why not? Uh, I just want to know when the Smiths came into the process, because that was a significant part of it. Um, it came in by joke um, and just became this running joke for us. I, I knew I want, I, I really liked the, I, I love how soon is now, and I love the idea of a guy, I love the millennial idea of a guy having a playlist as a, ostensibly a serial killer. And I thought, what music would soothe this person? And I thought, how soon is now is kind of an interesting way to soothe somebody to drop their blood pressure and, and heart rate so that you can do something that requires. But after that, I mean, we did many, many, we did like a whole Tony Bennett version. We did <laughs> Dusty Springfield version. We did Mozart. We did, And we also had like this whole Joy Division, Susie and the Banshees, but it started sounding like Matt Pinfield's iPod. So we reined that back in and every time a song would fall out, we would kind of go, what about girlfriend in a coma? And <laughs> it just kept sticking. It sticks. Uh... Hey guys, how are you? Thanks so much. Um, it's been very, sort of very subjective, visceral, strange little film. Laugh out loud funny sometimes. Okay. I'm really fascinated for both of you guys. What really drew you to make a film about a killer? I know it's based on a graphic novel, comic book, and I've been talking about it for some time, but I'm really fascinated what just drew you as artists to the story. Well, I, 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 yeah, um, I, you know, uh, just working with David, you know, uh, had that opportunity, um, so I would have taken anything, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was something, you know, I've been uh, talking with uh, partners at the, I have a production company, film company, and it was, I was like, oh, you know, not to make something like Point Blank or Les Samurai, which I'd seen um, pretty recently, actually. And I was like, this is like, you know, I love these kind of films. And then 
Mm, Luck would have it. And I was like, <laughs> perfect. And, and again, truly, I I read the the graphic novel and thought, how do you make? How do you literally take the audience's eyeball and put it in the character's eye socket? That was really it. <laughs> uh, Sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's something also really thrilling about a uh, incredibly effective adult thriller that is kind of built out of set pieces that is not an action movie. That's a globe-trotting kind of thrilling movie. I think I told you, like, very different type of film with the French Connection, like a lot of John Bob, uh, where there's... Here they are. I like the French Connection. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, 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 we got some more. Here we go. Yeah, let's 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 do this, and I'll get you. I'll get you next. Leap on. Yeah. Hi, David. Can you speak about your process in post production, as far as like tackling scenes, sequences, reels? Do you like for the first cut? Do you watch the whole movie and start tackling those? Or? Yeah. No, you have to. I mean, is look. It, the hardest thing is not getting trained to know where to look because you know you get eight or 10 edits into a film, your eyes start to, you really, you, you know what the next cut's gonna be, and so it starts to feel smooth, and you go, wow, this is really working, but it's really that you've seen it a thousand times. So, but I I kind of mandated that you have to, you have to watch it all the way through as, as many times as you can endure. I mean, on a real by real basis, it's like, yeah, you're, you're whacking it together to just sort of see where the shape is. But once you kind of have that, then the the first the first real cut, yeah, we try to we try to watch it at we try to watch the whole movie at every at every step. I pretty much like every Friday. And that's um, it's really difficult because that's you have to rely on technique. You have to rely on their memory of what it was that you read in the script that seemed interesting or, or how it would play out for strangers. And so you're kind of, you know, once you, and and when you once you have trained the eye travel so that you're picking everything up in advance, you do have to go back and erase and mushrooms help. <laughs> uh, real quick, I want to. He's ask, kidding. <laughs> I did want to ask you about working uh, with your DP with Eric, uh, and especially that I'd love to know the process. On set, if you um, if you didn't storyboard this movie, what was the process of showing up, breaking down these scenes? How did you guys we we would show up at you know we'd show up at seven or whatever in the morning. Usually, rehearsals like forty or forty five minutes, and we kind of lay out procedurally what it is that had to happen. We'd walk through it, mark everything, and then Michael would go off, and then we would step through it, take stills, and kind of go. These are the, you know, I think the scene that has the most setups in it is probably the hallway getting through the, the closing glass door, mm -hmm. which I think we showed up and it was like, we walked through it in about six minutes and was like, okay, 28 setups. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so that was, uh, no, normally that's kind of how we do it, just find it. Um, and, and, you know, we've, we've done this for five years now or something, and so, or six years, so. Um, he, you know, Eric is an incredibly nimble thinker, um, has, has a lot of uh, interest in, in art and photography, has a lot of reference points, and is, you know, very three-dimensional about um, what we can do. And so we, we generally find that stuff pretty quickly. Um, and then it's just the number of iterations. Have you worked like that for a while, or was there? Did you did you did you board your? Well, we started stuff? working um, together on Mindhunter. We just never really had a lot of time. You know, television is is a, a grind. Um, so, yeah, we we got pretty facile in the best sense. So I like the use of uh, technology in um, you know in terms of opening the locks on the on the motorcycle and you know all the the uh, the way you called in the lock. <laughs> but talk about, can you talk about the encryption key that you you know when you order from Amazon and is that that you know when Keto's choices are those real choices and okay. I, I <laughs> so um, there was there was originally like a two page scene I forgot exactly what it is that happened there but it was a very involved 
stealing of the key and 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 uh, then taking it some place where it had to be copied or something like that. And, and I remember we were in Chicago, we were tech scouting, and I was um, texting with uh, Andy, and I said, "We just go and find out whether there's an RFID copier that you know they would sell to pedestrians." That you know, he's like, "Dave." That's just terrifying. If something like that existed, like no one would ever take a key from, you know, a hotel concierge or whatever. Like you would never, you wouldn't try. The entire fabric of the universe would be destroyed. I was like, I just, just do it. And he literally, eleven seconds later, sent me that that screen um, that showed, you know, all these RFID copiers for twenty nine dollars or less that can be delivered to your Marriott suite. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that was weird. What do you think? First of all, a congrats, great film. And then I like to hear you talk about Eric, as we were really happy to give him like a cinematography icon award like three weeks ago and uh, at the Mallorca Festival. And then he talked a little bit about the fight scene as well. And you just mentioned that there were like massive dollies in in the room, but it doesn't no, look like it. So uh, they're yeah. bigger than a DSLR. And yeah, got it. David, David was working, you know, with the cameras this big, and we had dolly and track in some cases, and where they had to be thrown over it. Yeah, my my question there is, as I'm a cinematographer myself, when did you basically decide to shoot that way? Because it feels quite often really handheld, and that kind of Right to it. Well, um, I'm not. I'm not a huge fan of handheld, and I and I'm not certainly not a huge fan of the kind of like, you know, Law and Order. Like, <laughs> I'm a little tipsy kind of thing. <laughs> like, I don't like it when when the camera's just moving because why not? Um, I do like, you know, the Zapruder film. I do like it when there's you know the activity that's kind of or or a lack of finesse that's cued by something that's happening and you can't just like put a camera in your shoulder and start wiggling it around and have people who are hurting themselves and each other you know <laughs> kill each other for five or six or seven days or eight days and <laughs> and so the idea was we're gonna lay track we're gonna put the dollies down we're gonna do and then we're gonna stabilize it all so we know exactly where everyone is and then we're gonna add handheld in so that we could make sure that when the bong breaks across the cheekbone that we can follow the glass and come back so it was all um it looks very rough and it's all insanely orchestrated that's the other thing i wanted to ask you actually about in the editing process because i know you shoot with the 8k camera so you have that resolution how much in the editing are you also Find, you know, going in and finding other frames, and we don't do that, but we but we'll stabilize um, stabilize ninety percent of every um, almost every shot. Yeah, we got stabilize. Got it. Got it. Uh, let's do uh, let's do one more. Let's, uh, good luck so far. There've been terrific questions. Maybe there are none left. <laughs> We've had every single uh, where other oh, back up. Yeah, there we go. Right there in the middle. Um, I have a question about the scene with Tilda in the restaurant, and um, throughout the film, the assassin keeps saying, anticipate, don't improvise. And it wasn't clear to me what his, whether he was anticipating an action going in there, or if he was improvising, and like his character arc was changing. So if you could speak to that, because while I was watching it, he was improvising. He was improvising. Okay. Yeah, I mean the whole idea of having the mantra. I mean, uh, it's a little bit it, it, in terms of exploring subjectivity. You know, you have a character who speaks to himself or talks about what it is he's up to. Well, you know, there's this kind of presupposition that when the audience is intercepting the thoughts of a character, that that's the truth. And what we wanted to play with is just because this guy stands in front of the mirror and goes, you're the boss, you're the boss, you're the boss, <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean that he is or that he feels that way. And, and, you know, a lot of people talk to themselves. A lot of people who do talk to themselves, have an inner monologue, are, I don't 
<laughs> so that was kind of part of the, the root system. Uh, yeah, and the movie is also incredibly funny, I found. I was, I, I think, it was really funny. Yeah. Uh, I think we've, uh, I think we've accomplished it. Let's give a huge round of applause to the new